Thank you for joining us today for our virtual meetup titled Accelerating Fraud Detection with AI. I'd like to begin by introducing our speaker today. Jagdish Rajarajan is a data scientist at H2O.ai and is a part of the customer success team in the APJ region. He's an IIT Kanpur alumni and comes with rich data science experience across multiple industries. A few logistics before I pass it on to Jagdish. Number one, this presentation is being recorded. A copy of the recording and the slide deck will be sent out to you shortly after in the next day. Number two, you can send us your questions throughout the session. We will be very happy to answer them towards the end of the session. With that, the stage is yours, Jagdish. Yeah, okay, thank you, SP, uh, for your introduction. Hi, I'm Jagdish, and uh, as SK said today, our uh, topic of discussion is going to be uh, accelerating fraud detection with AI. And um, yeah, so this is going to be our agenda. First, we'll start with a brief introduction to his tool and driverless AI. We'll understand um, some of the uh, fraud detection common use cases. We'll um, go through uh, the challenges in modeling, which also includes um, what some of the current legacy systems uh, use and how we want to go there. We'll later look at uh, some strategy and tips with respect to how do we use uh, like AI for uh, like like solving the fraud detection use case. And um, we'll also see uh, some techniques, both in supervised learning and unsupervised learning. We will be using driverless AI uh, for a demo for uh, covering the supervised learning example. And for unsupervised learning, um, we will just uh, look at using H2 open source. Some of the unsupervised learning techniques will also be available as part of driverless AI as well. And um, yeah, so this is gonna be our agenda. Uh, so to start with, uh, Histo, we are an open source leader in AI and machine learning. Our uh, goal is to make your company an AI company, right? So what we mean is, um, so we always say this, uh, you can make a successful business out of just data and AI, but if you want to make transformations, uh, you need to take um, your people along. So, um, so what we want to do here is to uh, make AI transformations. So our transformation is uh, like whatever industry uh, you are in this case, we are talking about uh, financial industry and fraud detection. So, uh, so we want to help uh, every other industry and every other company transform themselves into an AI company using um, the H2O uh, like AI suit. So this is a brief uh, snapshot about H2O as a team. Uh, we are a team of uh, 240 plus experts, uh, over a thousand universities users and more than uh, 20,000 uh, companies uh, use our uh, sort of products. We also have a very strong uh, meter presence uh, because of our uh, roots in the open source and uh, some of our popular customers. And we have offices now almost all over the globe. Yeah. So yeah, that's another thing which I want to like highlight. Uh, so there's something I see you always say is time is the only non-renewable resource. Right? So whatever we do, it's a part of H2O. We always uh, make sure that we accelerate the value our customers and our users uh, get out of the time they invest in our framework, right? So that is something you can always reflect. So uh, even in this use case or any other things which we uh, present, we always try to make sure that the time you invest on the tool, uh, you get maximum output out of that. Yeah, so now coming to the question, uh, why bother about uh, fraud detection, right? If you see that um, we were already in a like S curve of transformation in terms of um, like the digital transformation now with COVID in 2020, right? This has just increased. We've started spending more time with uh, like our devices, which means we are more uh, like online now, which also means we have started doing a lot of online things. This is the rise of online, like online shopping, even like you know, looking for doctors online, um, online food delivery systems and et cetera. Right? And uh, wherever there is an explosion of these kind of uh, transformations happens, there is uh, like a rise of uh, like, you know, loopholes and uh, like expo um, exploitations. You see um, how online transactions have increased. So this is one of uh, an Indian provider called Paytm, right? Uh, I've taken directly out of their blog, um, some of the stats they had put out in public. So we see a massive increase uh, in mobile, uh, like in online payments, right? Because of COVID. And this is not just with respect to like a single, uh, like, you know, transaction provider. Uh, we see this across uh, like, you know, um, like multiple providers and like, you know, multiple mediums, right? So this, uh, and like, uh, not to, uh, like, you know, uh, forget, right. COVID was just an accelerator, 
this wave of digital transformation was already happening right the like many governments were already pushing for digitalization for like a lot of um, good reasons now when um, so many good you uh, like so many new users and uh, new segments of people uh, and entirely like you know uh, new uh, cohorts of people are start using online transactions right uh, it's very easy uh, for someone to come and exploit them and cause fraud naturally like you know the online frauds also like start to increase in like you know uh, in terms of numbers right so the, so that's why we need to focus on fraud detection systems now let's first discuss about some of uh, the key factors about our legacy fraud detection systems uh, mostly most of the systems have been rule based systems and uh, they have been established by domain experts like with a lot of careful thought over it uh, as an because these are rule based and uh, mostly implemented in c c++ or a sql uh, these are fast and we call it line speed line speed is almost the speed in which the transaction takes place right so it hardly like you know blocks the speed of the transaction but one of the problem is uh, it has a high rate of false positives so false positives is what we mean by so when you mark something as a fraud but the actual instance is not a fraud and why we have high rates of fraud in the case of rule based system first um, 100% accuracy is never possible because of rule based systems because we will just block it right so rule based systems could mostly work like this let's say you know a specific place from which uh, fraud usually happens a lot so you would try to block that specific place but then it doesn't mean that you know everybody in that region is actually a fraudster like you like you naturally uh, are also blocking genuine um, transactions right which results in uh, like customer dissatisfaction and it also like you know uh, help uh, like causes businesses to lose some form of revenue and this is one of the biggest concerns with fraud detections uh, in the from the point of legacy systems now other challenges include that um, things uh, keep evolve so we need to always keep adding new rules and uh, in this process uh, it's almost uh, impossible to cover all possible scenarios and uh, even if we cover say 80 90% of the cases uh, it requires a lot of manual labor to keep adding new rules so this is uh the current uh, like you know um, state when you look at some of the legacy systems right and this is what we want to change uh for the good uh using uh, ai systems like we want to uh, have high uh, like low rates of false positives at the same time uh, keeping a higher uh like rates for true positives so yeah now we look at um, some of the uh, popular use cases i've used mostly movie references and uh, web series references so that it's easy for people to understand so one form of uh, uh, like you know online fraud is identity theft where if you see in this movie identity theft right so the person on the left is actually named uh, sandy biglow patterson so the right side is actually a woman but she, she um, because the name sounds like woman so she uh, try to steal this person's identity and created her own identity the same name right and then uh, she is using uh, the original uh, protagonist identity uh, to make um, not just financial crimes but all sorts of crimes and uh, she tried to find some loopholes in the system and uh, because of those loopholes uh, she is capable she is capable of running away from the fraud so this is a like popular fraud use case identity theft and um, so that was more of a like hollywood example now let's coming back to india uh, this is a, actually a real story where um, the small village in india called jamtara where uh, people actually group together and uh, start doing otp phishing so they call people mostly targeting senior citizens and other vulnerable population and um, they uh, try to uh, pose as if they are from the bank or the uh, like credit card uh, provider and then they try to uh, get the otp uh, from the customer uh, from the end user and then they use it for um, taking money out of their cards right so this is otp phishing this is a slightly like large scale fraud uh, we might have come across this again uh, using a based on a like recent web series again based out of a uh, real life example of a harshad mehta scam in 1992 back then it was around estimated to be around 4000 crores in today's value easily around 20000 crores right so in this case uh, it's a collusion between uh, like you know banks and harshad mehta for uh, issuing uh, fake bank receipts and using that money for uh, 
indeed uh, manipulating the stock market right so there is like all kinds of uh, financial frauds happens and uh, financial institutions have been uh, fighting this real hard uh, another example slightly moving away from um, these uh, this is a histo case study as one of our customers uh, paypal uh, the case study is available in histo's blog and there is also a video out of uh, histo world you can have a look at it so this is called collusion fraud collusion fraud is a uh, in an online transaction systems where um, both the sellers and the buyers collude together and actually steal away from uh, paper so uh, this is also an interesting use case so you can uh, see how uh, we have solved this problem uh, like what kind of techniques have been applied and um, so yeah so these are some of the uh, popular use cases now uh, let's come to the challenges in uh, modeling to detect fraud let's say if you use uh, like a for detecting fraud what kind of challenge we might come across number one is uh, definitely extreme class imbalance um, typically like you know 0.01% you don't have every uh, like you know one in three transactions to be fraud right if that's fraud like we'll obviously go bankrupt right so uh, the if you see the general ml framework we don't really uh, account for it right so we need to really uh, focus on imbalance models for these kind of problems uh, then uh, not just imbalance we also have class overlap right and it's definitely not iid because if you see uh, the fraudulent transactions are being done to uh, like you know fake uh, our um, so it's done to like you know cheat our mental model of like you know what's a fraud and non fraudulent transactions done by smart people uh, so we hardly see a difference between the transactions which are fraud and which are non fraud third factor being concept drift concept drift is uh, what we call as uh, say today you invent some rules or let's say your model learns some patterns to detect a fraud right now obviously uh, the person who is committing the fraud if this um uh, if his current technique is not working uh, he is not going to stop actually he is going to uh, like identify new techniques um one of the example is um so i uh, so in both the case of this uh, jantara otp phishing and harshad mehta scam um like when like one of for let's take the jantara example uh so government started detecting that uh, like suddenly uh, like there's a lot of uh, credit card scams are happening from a specific region so uh, like obviously this specific re- uh, geo location was uh, targeted and they used to spe- uh, specifically go to uh, some open fields in that village and uh, start making these calls uh, the systems were able to detect it and um, they successfully even blocked it but the people didn't really stop uh, because the specific geo location was identified and um, stopped what they actually did is uh, they became smarter and uh, they started going to uh, places like you know shopping malls in uh, mumbai chennai and bangalore where uh, the case of such frauds happened like much less right so now you are targeting re- uh, geo locations which have a good uh, like a high rating um, compared to uh, geo locations which have a very uh, bad rating Right. so people always evolve over time so our models also have to evolve so same as the case was harshad mehta if you would have uh, read uh, uh, about uh, his uh, examples like so people always find uh, like new ways of um, evolving like you know when you detect their current strategies right and the fourth is uh, dealing with real data so um, like if you see the top 3 like it is possible to build a, like you know uh, like uh, we can build powerful data science models Uh, but at the same time we need to keep in mind uh, that it's a balance between speed and power right so we also need to uh, work with real time data with uh, like you know massive volumes so these are some of the uh, challenges uh, in uh, modeling uh, fraud detection right so uh, so having said this thing right so now we'll uh, try to uh, understand like you know how do we go about uh, like solving a fraud detection problem so uh, now this is before even going to uh, machine learning this is more of a high level framework so what i want to introduce is a framework called ooda so this was proposed by john boy so john boy was a pilot in the us uh, air force uh, to give a brief introduction about him uh, so before the era of uh, john boy uh, the aircrafts uh, were typically getting like you know more stronger more powerful and more bulkier right uh, so that was the uh, like phase in which it was going on so what john boy uh proposed in the uh, aircraft was uh, so this led to the f series f15s and those kind of uh, aircrafts 
so it is not uh, more power which matters to win in an aerial fight combat what needs what we need is fast transients and for that we need to be able to move quicker so what he is he mean by moving quicker is uh, let's say uh, how human beings typically take um, actions so we do it in the form of uda so we observe the environment we have we orient so we all have a like you know a conscious and subconscious understanding of uh, what the environment uh, we have around us and then we decide uh, given our observation and our orientation what is the uh, uh, like action we need to take and then we perform that action so this is a very simple uh, like framework but uh, this has been like you know widely used uh, in a lot of uh, theories of john boyd and uh, successfully like made huge transformations in the form of uh, aerial um, combat so uh, like what john boyd uh, really says is uh, in order to win right you need to be able to make fast transients and when you say fast transients uh, uh you need to be able to get inside your um, adversary's uda loop and um, let me take some small scenarios and uh, walk you through like you know what this really means right so this is a normal uda loop let's say you have observe um, desire and act orient we have put in the middle because uh, orientation is something which constantly keep happening right let's say you have a sports match uh, right cricket or football you would see that the players are constantly doing all of them the players are observing uh, the players are having an orientation of like you know what is happening uh, in the field uh, they decide what needs to be done and they act right let's say you watch the sports match right in this case uh, you are not the one who is participating so the action is out of the thing so for you it looks like more like a simulation you observe you may even decide like you know what the players should do but you are not the one who is acting right and then based on what the players are doing uh you again reorient and you observe you decide so this is kind of a simulation phase um so then uh if you see tune close loop uh, is an example where you take the orientation away uh for example you do you orient like once in a while let's say you build a machine learning model uh right you know uh in a normal scenario um like you don't uh update your model every day or every second right maybe uh periodically you may update your model so uh like you build a model once and then you observe new data you uh, predict for the new data and pass it on to the end users to take action based on that but then the and then every uh, once in a while uh, you run the orientation so this is kind of a thing so if you could see that you know uh, this simple framework of uda can be like you know put in uh, place for a uh, like lot of uh, scenarios of our decision making and what we want to cover for fraud is something called adversary inside your uh, decision cycle so what john boyd says about adversary inside your uda loop is something like a man in the middle type of conceptual attack where you have a mental model of uh, what the reality is and then uh, your opponent is trying to get inside you like be- even before you react if your opponent is able to react uh, so then he uh, makes the win uh, take the uh, case of uh, any of the fraud right let's take the jantara example um what happens is that we have a mental model of like you know how online transaction work right let's say uh, senior citizens or someone right so uh, now if any of uh, the person who is doing otp phishing if he is able to get inside uh, this person's uh, like you know decision making framework and uh, before this person realize that you know they are being uh, trapped into a fraud scheme right if they can uh, shell out some money out of them so they win right so that's the problem and um, like this typically happens uh, even before uh, the fraud detection systems identify such patterns and hold it um, even in the case of uh, the harshad mehta scam if you see right so back then uh, we didn't had uh, that much uh, like the, the indian financial system didn't had so much checks for preventing some of this uh, bank receipt related frauds and a lot of people were like naturally like taking advantage of that so so this is also a case of uh, like a, um like man in the middle uh, like kind of uh, uda attack where before the financial system uh, is able to react to the issue like uh, somebody saw this as an opportunity and uh, make made profit out of it so uh, uh, we will come to detail about like you know why uh, we look at uh, why we um, focus on uda one of the main reason is um, that it is not just uh, important to build a model which is fast in terms of performance uh, uh, and uh, like you know powerful in terms of detecting the accuracy it is also important to adapt right you know we need to, you need to build it in a way uh, that 
like we are able to constantly like you know iterate and move because uh, as we build models and as we build strategies uh, the adversary is also uh, trying to get inside so it's always a battle about you know who is able to get inside who's uh, like you know decision cycle so the faster person uh, wins in the race out here right so uh, now let's quickly go to um, a demo and then uh, uh, we will we'll see how to solve uh, a fraud detection use case using driverless ai and then we'll come for some practical tips of um, detecting uh, fraud yeah so here i have driverless ai uh, open uh, for us so for the people who don't know much about driverless ai we'll start with the uh, basics Yeah, I think the browser isn't really responding. So let me go back to the tips, and uh, we'll come back to the Revelers A demo, like you know, uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, let's say you want to detect fraud detection using uh, data science. What are some of the things which you can keep in mind, right? Uh, one is uh, like whether you want to go with compact features versus comprehensive features. Uh, we always say that um, if it's a like if you if you have a like you know single a feature out of a single transaction, uh, which is compact, uh, right? Um, so and if Uh, the, something which can be generated like faster uh, during real time transactions uh, always prefer over uh, comprehensive features it's it's always a balance but then uh, the more uh, compact features uh, or the features what we would call as a zero prior knowledge features like say features which are out of a single um, like transaction say right? something which doesn't where you don't have to go back in time uh, over 15 days or 30 days uh, and uh, generate uh, features based out of that so those kind of features are always uh, more useful will be very handy if some of them uh, prove to be useful right if at all you want to use uh, like you know prior knowledge features uh, the adv uh, the advice would be to either uh, like you know pre calculate some of them and keep it so that it can be accessed faster or uh, try to go back uh, for a shorter period of time maybe 15 days 30 days right instead of going full on for 3 years 5 years right because the longer uh, the longer and the broader you go in terms of collecting features the more time it's going to uh, take for you to uh, collect these features and uh, like you know pass it on to uh, subsequent engines enriching the information and then uh, using them for making predictions so it's essentially always a balance between uh, the number of features the type of features and the complexity of features right so uh, like easier said than done uh, because these directly correspond to fast accurate and robust models and the fourth one is uh, uh, we always think about um, building complex models Uh, so yeah, the tool is a uh, driverless AI. Uh, so we'll. There was a question on uh, what tool is that? Yeah, elaborate on um, compact and comprehensive features. Yeah, sure. I'll uh, quickly do that. So this is uh, driverless AI. We'll come back uh, like slightly on this. So let me go back and um, focus on the demo. Sorry, the tips now. And uh, once we finish this, we'll again um, go back on this. So. Uh, <clears throat> if uh, glm works then use it uh, so this is again a one, one of the simpler models so we always are saying that we always uh, think about uh, building a complex model sometimes what would be useful is uh, you build uh, simple models uh, maybe build multiple simple models for multiple segments of the transactions say that uh, let's say the credit card samples right uh, we typically have different um, clusters of transaction there are some high really high value transactions and there are some really uh, low value transaction and then transactions in the middle right uh, the behavior pattern is going to be different right and we can have uh, segments based on geo locations uh, we can have segments based on like almost any uh, like you know a demographic factors uh, available with us right so when you build like you know a lot of simple models and use uh compare those models and see which model is working better so in a lot of uh, real life scenarios these models are more interpretable they are more effective 
and uh, they also perform uh, like really well uh, like with respect to our benchmarks like beat <coughs> the speed or accuracy or uh, the robustness of generalizing to uh, more use cases so these are some of the stuffs and uh, yeah this is what i meant like models as commodity uh, that um, instead of just building one complex model and using it everywhere uh we can treat it as a commodity because in today's scenario right i will we will later look at how driverless can uh, make like you know multiple models um that's to say like models as a commodity uh you should be able to like you know build uh, in today's scenario with so much of tools available uh, easily you can build so much of models and see uh like you know which model is performing better and then use it uh then is uh, secondary signals in some of the use cases we have worked uh we see that there is a lot of value in terms of uh, secondary signal let's say you are a credit card provider uh like uh, the online retailer uh, they themselves might have a, like lot of information about the transaction right uh the what is the ip address what is the location how many transactions have happened in this ip address for a specific user uh how often the ip have changed uh so on and so forth uh, that you can have a lot of secondary signals and these secondary signals Uh, i must admit that like takes uh, some time to compute uh, if we haven't like you know pre computed and like you know uh, keep it available but uh, like they improve the accuracy of the models a lot like so if you are just uh, if you are not using a lot of secondary signals and if you think uh, secondary signals are available uh, you can uh, like spend some time in thinking like you know what kind of secondary signals you can um, incorporate for your uh, use case and then uh, like yeah this is pre calculation so um, like for a geo for a segment for a like you know season or time of the day you can always uh, calculate transaction value risk right so some of these things uh, like if you have already like pre calculated uh, this can speed up uh, right a lot of people actually do this these days but just highlighting it so that you know uh, like when you are working on uh, this kind of a use case or a similar use case uh, this might be of handy if uh, speed is a concern for you and then last uh, like uh, feature types typically if you see there are some feature types which are faster than others say boolean uh, integers and factors would be much faster uh, whereas if you use uh, strings or text right um, or image uh, it's slightly like uh, not so fast compared to boolean or uh, integers so you always uh, like you know if you can uh, have a, if you have a feature or feature uh, and if you can uh, take a like boolean signal out of it and if you think the signal is working uh, on par with the actual uh, text data or a uh, factor right always go for the boolean because the boolean is going to make the model like more faster right so uh, even in terms of feature engineering if you can think a little and uh, this thing it's okay for um, like from a research point of view to uh, look com- uh, to look for all possible features but then um, when you want to go to production if you can uh, like you know restrict the features to fast uh, like you know types uh, it's going to help you a lot so now that we have covered some of the tips let's go back to um, driverless ai right so this is um, a data set uh, based out of uh, kaggle uh, just for like you know confidential and privacy purposes so uh, the data is uh, like uh, there is a transformation being applied uh, called principal component transformation just so that um, the actual uh, fields and the signals are anonymized so that's fine but then it doesn't affect uh, like much of the how the use case is going to function so uh, so we can assume that like you know depending on your use case you have a bunch of features like say 50 100 200 250 and then uh, we have the prediction clauses like you know fraud or no fraud and we also have the transaction amount right so if you are using driverless ai how uh, like you would particularly go is also we have uh, we automatically provide uh, quick uh, insights on uh, the data so we show uh, like you know histograms with spikes skewed histograms uh, like uh, column columns where there is a gap in the histogram outliers and any recommendations we have for the data you have right so um when highlight you any correlations between the columns and stuff so if you see transaction amount right how it's uh, which columns are correlated well which columns aren't really correlated uh, so this can help you make quick decisions out of pardon me
yeah so the auto insight uh, the auto visualization uh, technically helps you to uh, understand the data faster so let me uh, open some of these plots so you see that you know which columns have uh, spikes in them uh, which columns have outliers uh, right and um, how do you want to go about it so if you are like you know uh, so uh, i discuss this concept called uh, commodity uh, like using models as commodity let's say you are building uh, like you know uh, dozens of models right uh, like um, for like different sub populations so this uh, the auto visualizations can help you understand uh, the issues with any of the sub population much quicker than uh, uh, how you would do it um, on your own it uh, so we calculate a like whole bunch of um, visuals but we uh, show you only those insights which you need to look at it based on some um, statistical uh, calculations right so now uh, if you want to build a model uh, inside uh, using driverless ai it's very simple all you need to do is uh, right click and click predict so when you click predict um, what you're going to have is uh, this kind of uh, like setup say i'm giving a name for my experiment you need to select the target column right so in this case it's class and if you want to drop any columns you can do that i'm going to keep all the columns because there are no uh, unwanted columns i have out here and um, so this is a classification task so once i given the class it automatically identified that uh, it's a classification it chose me uh, like you know loss function if i want i can change it uh, to some other loss function based on my choice and it automatically uh, gives me a setting of accuracy time and um, interpretability what these knobs mean uh, accuracy uh, so high values of accuracy means uh, generally uh, like you know more cross validation uh, like you no know, more robust checks at the same time it's going to take like more time to build the model right uh, and uh, time means uh, like higher time means more time for the genetic algorithm um, uh, which is running in driverless ai and this genetic algorithm is uh, responsible for building powerful features uh, and feature engineering which uh, increases the performance of the model again um, more time will uh, take the experiment to learn for like a longer period of time say if i increase the time you see that you know the number uh, the numbers here uh, increasing the num the time for feature evolution and the final pipeline and those stuffs so if i decrease them uh, right it's going to decrease so earlier the estimated uh, time was in hours now it's in minutes right so and i put like 1 1 and 5 uh, now this is going to run much faster than what i used to have before interpretability is for like you know whether you want to give preference for more interpretable uh, models and techniques or um, you want to uh, have have focus for like higher performance again like high interpretability means uh, uh, like models which are more interpretable and uh, more interpretable insight so generally like uh, um interpretability uh, is kind of um, like in, in some ways uh, it saves time because it doesn't build power, like you know complex models it builds simple models Uh, and uh, it also uh, like spend some time in building this uh, interpretable uh, um, capabilities so right so this is uh, how so you we can design like models in three ways let's say um let me just quickly change the target column and um, come back to this so the moment you uh, choose a target column driverless ai will automatically identify accuracy time and interpretability setting and uh, you can just click launch experiment so that is one way of uh, running the experiments in said driverless ai if you are a slightly more experienced user you can tweak this knobs the way i have uh, like tweak based on your setting so i in this case i have decreases the accuracy and time so that the experiment finishes fast if you want a powerful model maybe uh, like an you know, contrary is that like this is also a common setting uh, sometimes people use um, like where you have the accuracy and time to be high and the interpretability to be low in this case you just are concern about uh, like you know higher performance uh, not so much about interpretability right the predictions are more important to you than the explanations uh, both these things are kind of valid and then the third way is uh, so driverless ai is a powerful uh, capability uh, we ex expose almost everything to you in the form of expert settings right you can pretty much control all the settings of the experiment uh, what kind of um, models you want to put so we have models starting from like you know glms and rule fit models to like you know pytorch and tensorflow models uh like you can control the feature engineering um you can control settings for time series nlp image uh, we also have the section called um, recipes uh, wherein um, 
in addition to the like you know transformers which we have and uh, transformers uh, models and uh, scorers which we have you can bring uh, your own uh, set of model scorers and we also have an official uh, repository of transformers so we have a uh, let's say if you go to transformers right so for each of this settings right we have uh, like a lot of uh, transformers uh, recipes available like we transformers models or scorers right so so using export settings you can pretty much control everything um, inside so if you are really a super user uh, you can uh, go back to this thing right now coming again uh, uh, to repeat back what i just said uh, there are three ways in which you can run experiment one is just uh, upload the data select the target class uh, drop any columns if you want uh, this is just like how you do in excel and then click launch experiment second is uh, you can play with the knobs and then um, click uh, launch experiment in this case uh, based on your needs of accuracy time and interpretability a custom experiment is going to uh, run right and you will see in the left side panel every time you tweak this knobs it will tell you like what it's going to do uh, in terms of um, experiments right then uh, you either click experiment or you click uh, leaderboard if you click experiment what it's going to do is um, it's going to create an experiment for you so something like this what i have already uh, created so it took like roughly an hour uh, because i had a like you know high accuracy and time settings right and but it gave a pretty good model if you see the log loss right it's almost uh, zero uh, right and then uh, second is uh, you can click the leaderboard option which you had so when you click a leaderboard what the leaderboard actually does is create a project for you and it will create a, a dozen model for you like you know with different settings we'll start with the simplest models if you see it's like you know it's a 1 1 and it has very few features and it's a simple decision tree and then uh, towards the end we have uh, like uh, high accuracy uh, time settings with uh, tensor flow models are in place so we naturally move from like you know uh, like simple models to complex models uh, for each of the models you can see the performance on uh, what it had done what is the um, yeah so this is the simplest model you can have it literally had only one feature and it built a decision tree out of it right so uh, so it's very easy to understand uh, how different models work in um, driverless ai and try to go about it so yeah now that we have covered that so let's go back to uh, our experiment and build a custom model for us right so again i'm um, going to repeat the steps so that it reiterates to some of the users so i'm selecting the target class uh, again uh, if you want you can drop any columns uh, if you have a test data set you can provide in this case uh, like i didn't really uh, generate a test data set so i'm not going to give a test data set but if you give a test data set it's going to calculate the matrix out of you <coughs> and give it to you automatically and because it's an imbalanced problem so what i'm going to do is i'm going to my expert settings and search for um, imbalanced yeah so uh, i'm going to create the sampling uh, techniques to auto so once i do this uh, automatically imbalanced models will start popping in so currently we have only light gbm xg boost uh, once i select the sampling techniques now you see that imbalanced models have started kicking in so so when you click the sampling techniques to be on in expert settings so what it does is uh, it starts using imbalanced techniques and another thing which i want to trigger is um, isolation forest i'm going to on um, isolation forest isolation forest is a technique uh, which is used for detecting anomalies so when you enable this what driverless a will do is uh, as a part of the pipeline it will also identifies anomalies and then use it um, uh, if you see some of the feature engineering techniques which uh, we have already selected uh it also includes um, clustering right so it does some um, unsupervised learning techniques already uh as a part of the feature engineering and use that as a features for this thing right and um, we have um, like now that we have select isolation forest now we have a bunch of feature engineering uh, transformations as a part of isolation forest as well so all these are base uh, like you know uh, feature engineering uh, transformations and in the process genetic algorithm will also uh, discover more uh, combinations of these and then uh, select the best variance for um, the experiment so let me click uh, the um, launch experiment option uh, this is going to take some time to run so that's why i already have uh, some of the experiments uh, done uh, available right say um, 
So this is the complete experiment with the same settings available. So this is the genetic algorithm stage, uh, which I was saying. So you could see like, you know, different models and uh, like a lot of uh, feature engineering techniques have been applied uh, along the way. And finally, the best model have been selected, right? So uh, when you're building like uh, complex models, models for like a lot of uh, subpopulations, right? Uh, Revelis AI can build it like really fast for you. Uh, if you could just see that, you know, in a matter of like few minutes, uh, we are able to build a model and uh, we are able to understand what is happening. And as a part of, so this is the final model. It's an ensemble, right? And you can click each of the model and try to figure out what is happening in the individual model. Uh, so what transformations have been applied, which features have been used. Uh, this is the second level of transformations. And then the final model is being fed and um, how it is um, happening. So yeah, so that's it uh, with respect to this thing in the, we'll handle um, any questions in the, towards the end of the session. We'll go back uh, to our uh, demo, right? So uh, like I covered some of the unsupervised uh, learning techniques uh, as a part of um, this thing. Let's say you don't have any labeled data and some people don't have. So uh, in that case, uh, what kind of techniques you can use? One is obviously isolation forest, uh, isolation forest, uh, this is something we showed in driverless AI as well. So what it does is uh, it takes of advantages of two properties. Uh, anomalies are usually few and anomalies are different from other instances. So we randomly select a feature and then we randomly select a split just like we do in a distant trees or random forest. And then we see uh, how much uh, splits it takes to isolate a single uh, sample. Let's say if you see this point, um, the example on the left and the example on the right, you could see that um, on my left, um, the point in the middle, uh, it's going to take much more splits uh, to isolate this sample than to isolate this uh, point on the right side, right? So uh, this is essentially how isolation forest works. And um, so if you see, uh, like, you know, when you, this is an example uh, from scikit-learn. Um, so you could see that it was able to essentially isolate all this uh, red points, which are anomalies, right? And uh, the the contour plots which you see is the decision boundaries, right? You could see that. Uh, so basically, we learn the decision boundary out of the given data, and then when new data comes in, um, any um, anomalies are there, uh, we will be able to isolate them easily. So this can be done both in supervised and unsupervised fashion. You can either give a threshold uh, for anomaly uh, percent, the percentage of anomalies, or you can give examples and uh, let the model uh, itself uh, understand the threshold. Right. And uh, this is how you do it in H2 open source, right? So you upload the same data, credit card at CSV, which I showed. Uh, the, it's, the code is hardly like four lines. You have a lot of examples available in our blog as well. You should be able to easily uh, use this uh, if you want to just try some unsupervised learning techniques for uh, like, you know, identifying frauds or anomalous transactions. The next example I want to highlight is um, auto encoders. So how auto encoders work is so we have an encoder engine and a decoder engine. And um, what typically happens is uh, you have an input, right? And uh, we try to regenerate the input back and whatever the error between the input and the output, right? Uh, this is the measured difference, uh, bit, uh, the measured reconstruction error or the difference between like, you know, what we expect and what we got, right? So when you uh, use an auto encoder to learn um, good behavior, like, you know, uh, behavior, uh, which is, uh, which you expect, right? When an anomalous transactions happens, obviously those uh, anomalous transactions are gonna have a large uh, reconstruction error, right? And that is indeed again being used for um, identifying anomalies. So both these techniques work practically really well, isolation forest and auto encoders, uh, right? So if you want to use, um, any of them uh, for this thing, I really recommend. So uh, this is an uh, image representation. Let's say you have an image uh, with a letter two in it. The encoder is actually gonna create some form of a compressed representation like this. So this in no way looks like two, right? It's uh, it's a compressed representation, but the decoder uh, regenerates from this compressed representation to the actual uh, like input. This, now this input uh, is a reconstructed input. This is not exactly the same as the image in the left, right? And the difference between these two is the reconstruction error. Now, what we are saying with auto encoders is when you have anomalies, right? The anomalies are going to have a larger reconstruction error than non-anomalous patterns. Okay, so, and that is being used. And when you compare this with PCA, PCA is also um, like a you know, compression algorithm, 
but pc is more of linear in nature whereas auto encoders can handle like you know non linear uh, different uh, like you know uh, it can handle like non linear features <laughs> and that's one of the advantages and that's why you can't use uh, something like pca for this whereas uh, an auto encoder is naturally a good fit um, for this use case again if you want to use uh, driverless ai uh, for uh, using uh, like you know anomaly detection uh, via auto encoders this is how you do it uh, like you would uh, find examples of this uh, like you know all over the internet like both from h2 one from other uh, open source bloggers right um, this is uh, so open source is, uh, so three is completely open source right uh, so feel free to try uh, like i am supervised learning as a, like if you have labeled data always uh, like you know supervised learning models are going to give you much much better results but um, when you don't have labeled data like you know you don't have much choice than to uh, use unsupervised learning techniques sometimes uh, you can use unsupervised learning techniques to uh, generate your data to like you know uh, have a start with a baseline data for your supervised learning model so basically you run uh, unsupervised learning identify anomalies and then then tag that anomalies as fraud or no fraud and then use that for your supervised model this is also a popular strategy which uh, like we've seen now with this we are kind of uh, reaching the end of the um, demo right we have our hoa learning center where there are like much more tutorials and uh, certifications available uh, we also have h2a aquarium so driverless ai is actually um, like an enterprise uh, solution but if you want to try driverless ai for uh, free uh, h2a aquarium uh, gives you uh, a free uh, license um, for uh, like for a short period of time uh, to try out uh, like the driverless ai models Uh, on uh, any data set of your choice yeah any um, questions awesome thank you jagdish um we have a few questions in the chat window if you in the q and q and a window let's begin by taking what we can answer in the time we have um how much or how, how little data is required to enable the ai to predict behaviors um, and differentiate between true transactions and fraudulent transactions uh there is generally no limit i mean the more is always the better but uh, at least you know uh, like say few uh, like uh, fraud is a big use case right uh, like uh, i would say so let's say a general uh, like for driverless ai at least uh, like you know uh, like 1000 plus rows should generally be fine but then if you are looking of a actual like you know real time fraud use case right we are talking about like you know millions of transactions right so uh, like you know i would say um, at least say uh, like 100k uh, like samples would be a bare minimal uh, when you are thinking about an actual use case right uh, so like we think of like large volumes but to build a model alone i think uh, even 1000 samples should be fine for driverless ai great thank you how does h2o help to detect drift uh, so we have uh, multiple uh, engines check for it so uh, a very holistic solution is we have something called uh, ml ops uh, which will give you like you know everything about uh, model drift uh, performance drift and etc as a part of running the models uh, we check for like you know data leakage uh, we check for like you know uh, data drift over time uh, so there are a bunch of checks uh, in the part of the experiment uh, section itself in driverless ai uh, when you click an experiment in driverless ai uh, under the insights uh, section on our notification section uh you will uh, see these uh, checks right now we do uh, check for data leakage uh, we see uh, there is a, like you know a drift over time so those kind of stuffs uh, checks we have in the experiments a much more uh, like a you no know, detailed solution uh, is also available in the form of uh, what we call as ml ops thank you There's a question here that said, uh, "Can we try this on H2O open source instead of driverless AI?" Yes, uh, you should be able to try out H2O open source as well. So I didn't really cover the supervised learning uh, aspect of H2O uh, open source because I wanted to cover both. Uh, but technically, yes. But if you use um, um, like H2O open source, you need to code some of the things by yourself, which driverless AI does it on your own. Driverless AI is more of uh, it has everything H2O open source has. uh plus a bunch of things more but if you want to do it uh so build a supervised uh, engine as well using h2 open source uh yeah definitely you can do it great 
Will the recording and slides be shared? Yes, they'll be sent out to you. Uh, can we get the source code of transformations used after creating a model? Uh, so there is uh, like a lot of these transformations are available in the form of open source recipes itself. Uh, so that is uh, there. We give you a scoring engine. I mean, if your concern is about, you know, like, you know, hey, you've built a model, now you need to score it, right? Uh, we give you uh, like scoring engines in like, you know, multiple uh, of it. So we give you a pure Python scoring engine. Uh, we give a, uh, like what we call it, Mojo model object optimized uh, scoring engines, which are built in C++ and Java with wrappers on Python and R or Java, uh, whichever you are feeling more comfortable with, uh, right? So uh, using that, you should be able to, um, right, you know, uh, build it. Uh, like uh, we should be able to score any new data, uh, but the source code of the actual transformers, uh, we don't provide. Thank you. The example you gave is based on a credit card. My project is something like a, a payments wallet and I mm -hmm. want to detect fraud. Where do I begin? Uh, so the similar, some of the, uh, like, you know, the broader tips, which we discussed, right? I guess that wouldn't change much. Uh, say a building a compact, comprehensive features, zero prior features. I mean, this thing, and you can also look at some of our case studies, uh, right? You know, the, um, this is a case study, like how uh, other people are this thing, right? So, um, so in the point of uh, fraud deduction, there are a lot of case studies we have done. There is another person called Ashrit. He is an in-house uh, security expert. He also have a bunch of uh, uh, use cases and talks related to fraud. So there are like a lot of material uh, we have available um, in the form of uh, like, you know, different uh, fraud deductions and similar problems, right? You can have a look at some of them. And definitely like do give a shot about uh, driverless AI uh, because uh, like you, when you run your, when you put, put your data into driverless AI and uh, see it, right? You would uh, figure out, you could uh, uncover a lot of um, insights on your data itself. And uh, second, uh, we give you uh, like uh, model reports and uh, model interpretability and some of these things we didn't cover uh, in the like you know, limit of time we had. So uh, you can understand a lot about this thing. So you can look at the broader level things and uh, driverless AI is capable of customizing to your data set. Like, you know, once you put your data set, uh, it can learn uh, and give you insights on your data and your use case. Thank you. We have very less data with fraud as our label. Then how do we unsample it? And if we don't unsample or balance it, um, it won't be out model be it, it won't be our model be biased then how do we handle this so, so it's just about handling the data yeah so sampling itself is a like you know tricky thing like you know you need to do uh, like typically people use um, some form of uh, oversampling uh, of the uh, weaker class or undersampling of the uh, like larger class people also use smart right if you just have numerical data so uh, like you need to do some amount of sampling but at the same time sampling not at the level of 50 50 percent balance Right. And when you do sampling, you also, uh, you can have sampling, you can have, uh, like, you know, loss function, weighted loss functions. Right. Um, again, one thing which I would say is that, uh, you can, um, like if you, if you can try driverless AI, I would say like, give it a shot and see like, you know, how driverless AI is doing it because it adapts to your data set and automatically does it. Uh, second thing, if you're doing it on your own, I would say, uh, like do, uh, you can try under sample, uh, like under sampling, or you can try smart. Uh, these are two um, good techniques and there are also imbalanced specific models available, like, you know, imbalance light GVM, imbalance XG boost, uh, right? You can also give it a shot of them. Uh, sometimes uh, imbalanced models work well and uh, to just to play devil's advocate, uh, we have also seen a lot of cases where um, sim like simple models perform, simple models with sampling techniques perform better than um, imba like, you know, models which are uh, targeted for uh, imbalanced data. So it's uh, very uh, use case specific. Uh, we need to give it a shot. Great. Um, how helpful is data augmentation in fraud detection? Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm a little skeptical. This is my personal uh, take uh, on data augmentation. So if you have image data, let's say like, you know, uh, like uh, one specific use cases, say you have insurance and those kind of things, you have image, so there, uh, image augmentation, data augmentation is useful. Uh, the only uh, form of uh, data augmentation which could be useful is uh, what we just discovered as smart. Smart, in, if, in a way, if you see is right, is kind of uh, uh, like data augmentation, right? So uh, 
it is like you know reasonably effective to uh, so to solve the imbalanced issue but it doesn't generate a lot of value so um, like one of the problems with data uh, augmentation uh, at least i have is uh, when you uh, like when you don't have a data on a particular region let's say when you don't have transactions beyond $10000 that is because of a reason right now if you augment the data and include points in there uh, our model is going to be uh, confident in a fake manner i mean we our model would become confident on areas where we don't want the model to be confident right and that's a pro uh, wrong behavior uh, we would want especially in fraud detection right uh, we don't want models to be confident on data which it hadn't um, observed now this itself is a, a big uh, area of discussion on like you know how do we make uh, our model not so confident on area a lot of models are prone for this issue where uh, it gives with high certainty on uh, like you know uh, the this the data space where it hadn't seen a lot of examples like where it had seen like only one or two examples all are in the positive or negative direction um it may uh, put it up right so uh, that's one of the problems we have with data augmentation thank you jagdish uh, we'll take one one last question now how frequently do we train the model for fraud detection um uh, so uh like i i'll tell you like i am not a domain expert on it so do not take uh, myself like very seriously uh, like maybe someone like ashrit would be a better person to handle it so uh, my personal take would be to do it uh, like uh, definitely not on a regular i am telling purely from a uh, like you know a common sense and like my understanding of the use case so when you uh, look at uh, the uh, space right so uh, if you retrain every uh, like day or like every, like too frequently we need to keep in mind of data drift and some of the other challenges like so uh, even a constantly updating model is also a point of headache for us right so uh, updating it like you know once in 15 days or once in a month is a realistic uh, window for us uh, updating the model alone right uh, the transactions alone can happen real time uh, but uh, we don't typically uh, ha uh, like i would recommend not to uh, like update the model uh, like you know every uh, like you know once in a while Awesome. Thank you, Jagdish. With that, we are at the end of our presentation. Do you have any final thoughts, or should we close? Yeah, I think uh, we can uh, close. Uh, so yeah, so most of the videos are available in the YouTube, uh, like in our YouTube channel, uh, like you know, uh, and our case studies are available in the blog, right? Uh, use cases, and uh, we always have the learning center. Awesome. thank you jagdish for taking the time and today and doing great presentation i'd also like to say thank you to everybody else who joined us today uh like mentioned earlier the presentation slides and the recording will be sent out in an email shortly have a great rest of your day everybody thank you yeah thank you sk thank you very much